Good afternoon. This is Dr. McDaniel, and it's uh, Monday, April 22nd. Thank you for joining me on GYN Corner. Yesterday, I spoke about uterine fibroids. Uh, I gave the definition, so fibroids are balls of uterine muscle. They can occur anywhere where there's muscle. You can have fibroids or fibromas or myomas, they're also called. Uh, uterine fibroids are in one of the three different layers of the uterus, or you can, can potentially have fibroids of the cervix. So uterine fibroids are in either the meat or the muscle of the uterus or inside the layer or the wall of the uterus. That's called an intramural fibroid. You can have them under the skin, pooching out of the uterus. That's a subserosal, or they can be under the lining inside the uterus. That's called an uh, submucosal fibroid. So submucosal, intramural, or subserosal. I spoke briefly about how the fibroids can pooch out like doorknobs or they can almost fall off, they hang off so much, latch onto something else, lose their blood supply to the uterus, and then those are metastatic fibroids. So they've moved on to different areas in the pelvis and generated blood supply. You can also have a fibroid that's falling out of the uterus through the cervix, that's an aborting myoma. So fibroids or myomas are balls of uterine muscle. They can occur, can occur anywhere in the uterine layers. And 99% of fibroids are benign. Less than 1% of fibroids will turn into cancer. We call those sarcomas. I spoke uh, yesterday about how different areas where the fibroids are can create different symptoms. So if the fibroids are pooching into the lining, bubbling up or cobblestoning the uterine lining, they can cause an increased surface area of the uterus. And when someone has their cycle, instead of having the average four to five day cycle, they can have a week and a half, two and a half, even three week menstrual cycles every month. They can, instead of just having lumpy, thick, or heavy cycles, they can have big balls or clots where they can have even fist size or larger size clots that plop out with the cycle. Um, if the fibroids are bulking up the uterus, so they're in the meat of the uterus, in the intramural layer, or they're underneath the skin of the uterus, subserosal layer, it's like popcorn kernels pop into popcorn. They just bulk up and get larger, 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 depending on how quickly or how slowly they grow, they can even get the size of a nine month, or as I like to say, a 10 month pregnancy. So they can get quite large. The only time we worry about fibroids is in one of two occasions, if they're growing rapidly. So say someone's uterus doubles in size within a couple of month time frame, that's very, very fast. So that would be worrisome for a uterine fibroid that's turned into a, a cancer, a sarcoma or malignant fibroid, or if they're causing a lot of grief for someone, someone with the three week cycles, or someone starting to look pregnant or having symptoms from that. So symptoms from the fibroid getting, fibroid uterus getting larger, 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 would be obstipation, which I discussed is blockage of the rectal canal, so it's hard to have a bowel movement or decreasing the capacity of the bladder so they can't hold their urine very much or they have to urinate frequently because they can't hold much urine or putting pressure potentially on different nerves endings inside the pelvis or the abdomen um, and i guess lastly but also be if they get really large then they decrease the capacity of the intestines so they can potentially slow down the intestines or cause heartburn reflux disorder because they're pushing up the diaphragm, pushing up the stomach muscle, stomach itself. So lots of different signs and symptoms that one can have from having a fibroid uterus. Um, the treatment for the fibroid depends on what kind of problems or issues you're having for it and what you want alleviated. So as I mentioned yesterday, you don't have to treat fibroids if they're not causing you grief. If someone's having bleeding issues for fibroids, uh, we always determine, or I guess it should say confirm specifically that the fibroids are the source of the bleeding issues. So the evaluation for abnormal bleeding in the face of having a fibroid uterus would be first off, 
we always send your urine to confirm that you don't have an infection because infection causes inflammation. Inflammation can destabilize the lining of the uterus and the unstable uterine lining will have abnormal bleeding associated with it, either all of the time with the cycle or just with activities that kind of jar the uterine lining and cause contractions or spasming of the uterus can induce abnormal bleeding. So it's in the urine to look for what we call an atypical, asymptomatic or subclinical cystitis or bladder infection. Since the uterus predominantly uh, lies on the bladder, if the bladder is infected or inflamed, whether or not you have predictable, typical or classic symptoms of that infection, it will destabilize the uterine lining because of that proximity or approximation of the uterus on the bladder. If someone is having abnormal bleeding, we also look for an, a sexual infection because both chlamydia and gonorrhea will do the same thing. They can ascend into the uterus or into the bladder, cause inflammatory changes due to the infection, destabilize the uterine lining. So we send the urine first off. Second thing that would be done would be to check blood, blood um, testing to look for hormonal issues, what we call medical conditions. So the hormones are always the same hormones. It's a hormone panel, and the panel should consist of uh, pituitary, prolactin level, thyroid, thyroid function testing, uh, ovarian hormones, LH, FSH, and E2. The, the first two are both hormones that the brain produces to affect the ovaries and the uterus, and the latter is estrogen, which is the hormone that the ovaries produce to affect the uterus. And there's always a blood pregnancy test for obvious reasons. Occasionally, if someone is pregnant, they can have abnormal bleeding. So those are the hormones. So first we check to see if there's an infectious reason for the abnormal bleeding because the lining is destabilized. Then we check to see if there's a medical reason for the abnormal bleeding uh, because of ovulation problems that can occur with medical conditions. And then lastly, we check to see if there is a physical source. So besides the fibroids, if there's potentially an abnormal growth or mass inside the uterus, in, instead of just fibroids, so a polyp would be an obvious reason, abnormal ball of blood vessels, or abnormal tissue buildup inside the uterus. Hyperplasia is a common one. And then we look for something physical outside, so potentially not as common, but potentially a case, an ovarian cyst, a teratoma, a mature teratoma, or a dermoid. Those are ovarian cysts that can have potentially different tissue changes and functions, so the cyst in a small percentage of the time will cause hormone production such as thyroid or pituitary uh, and they can affect the lining of the uterus. So those are that's the evaluation for abnormal bleeding in the face of a fibroid uterus. If all of those tests are normal, then occasionally we may do additional testing, which is a sophisticated sonogram where we put fluid in the uterus to, to open the uterus to see if there's any small tissue aberration that was not obviously seen on the traditional sonogram and or a biopsy, which is a sample of the uterine lining tissue to see if microscopically there are tissue changes that obviously we're not gonna know about just looking with the naked eye. So as I stated before, I'm trying to keep these posts down to 10 minutes. It's been about 10 minutes now, so I'm going to end it there today for the fibroid, and then we'll take up tomorrow. That'll be part three of the fibroid evaluation process and management. Thank you for watching. This is Dr. McDaniel at GYN Corner. Have a great rest of your Monday. Bye.